the one consistent academic voice we've had that's telling us to take our family history seriously, to do it in a disciplined way, has been John Franklin Christian. He has never devalued family history, and he he has a, he is a very rigorous ac academic. He writes history uh, as it is. He tells the truth. He, he does his research with incredible discipline, but he's still got the time to encourage us not only to value our family history, but to record and to write it and to see that it's, uh, see that it's archived. And uh, that's an incredible uh, thing from, um, from you, from, uh, from you. And uh, I think um, we've had other friends too in our group who have been in, in the world of academe, but have never had anything but support for us. But you, you have given us consistent support as a group to take our family history seriously, to keep doing it, to share it in the context of talk. And we've had fabulous talks here from people who've done the research well. And we'll look forward to paying it to hear when you're ready. And um, we, we like a good, brief, tight family history. Um, not just a roll call of names <laughs> that goes on for an hour. We like to hear how you feel about what you've discovered through your research. And that's, I think, what Gianfranco brought us to a, a, a point where we we could look, we, we could see the value of the work and then we'd have the, the courage to come up in front of everyone and share it. And uh, we've had incredible uh, stories that have really brought, uh, brought history alive to this group. So we've been very lucky with, uh, with, with the results of people beavering away doing the work. And I hope everyone will continue and not give up. So. Thanks so much for your support, and tonight we've also got your wonderful wife, Jane, here to uh, staff the book store, and the book is extremely well priced at $20. That's a fantastic, fantastically economical price to get a good book, uh, and it includes a lot of your story too. So it's pulling in both the themes of family history and the context of the whole Italian experience. So thank you so much for coming, and um, you you will put the firma on any book that's purchased. You will put the firma on. Yeah. So um, welcome uh, back again, and uh, thanks for coming. Thank you, Fabian, and thank you, Dominic, and uh, thank you to you, gentlemen, for inviting me to speak to you and for coming here uh, tonight <coughs> to to hear something about the history of Trieste, a history of uh, a group of uh, approximately 10% of the population who in the 50s and early 60s left the city. And in a way, uh, this history is still continuing. Not later than last week, uh, this, there was a resurgence, or there is a resurgence in Trieste, of this uh, independent autonomous movement, so much so that uh, the Italian police last week was trying to get the names of all the members of this association, which I really found very interesting because I always say that uh, Trieste's history has stopped uh, in 1945 or in the early 50s. Some of you may ask uh, why a book on Triestine migration? Why now, so many years after the events? What relevance does this history have today to contemporary Australia? The answer to these questions is simple. In the first place, a book on the history of Triestine migration and its causes has never been written before. Previous accounts have been ignoring, one would say uh, willfully, the complex political issues at the origin of this exodus. Often, these accounts have been tainted by nationalist ideology because their authors have always used archival material that exclusively supported one viewpoint, theirs. For instance, Triestine emigration was subsumed in the other much larger and tragic exodus of people 
who were forced to leave the territories ceded to Yugoslavia after the Second World War. However, the two phenomena have separate causes, and the reasons at the core of Trieste migration were obfuscated because they ill fit or are antithetic to the interpretation put forward by nationalist historiography, still predominant in a city that has not yet metabolized its troubled past. This book aims to illustrate the complex reasons behind the Triestine diaspora, reasons that have their roots in the great powers' Cold War rivalry, in the opposing Italian and Yugoslav nationalisms and their conflicting claims over Trieste, in the long history of Trieste's quest for autonomy, in the end of Anglo-American administrations in 1954, and in the economic conditions created by instability and by political design. Why to tell this history now? And should it matter to Australians? Again, the answer is yes, it should matter, because the evils of nationalism and of chauvinism and the byproducts of discrimination, racism, and attempts at cultural hegemony are not exclusive to one nation or one city or to a single historical period. The historian's task is to question and questions again all interpretations, to separate facts from myths, to analyze past events and to critically proclaim new interpretations, however unpalatable, however contrary to a widely and conveniently shared public opinion. Finally, to tell the Triestine story now is important because it is part of Australia's untold history, as well as of Italy's. For 500 years, until 1918, Trieste was part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. In 1749, it was granted by Empress Maria Theresa the special autonomous status of Freeport. During the 19th century, the city and its economy expanded exponentially, attracting people from many parts of the Mediterranean, and until 1892, its youth were exempt from serving in the Austrian army. This cosmopolitan city lived peacefully until the rise of opposing nationalisms, the Slav and the Italian, at the end of the 19th century. The conflict between the two main ethnic groups worsened with the passing of the years and was exasperated with the rise of fascism, its policy of cultural genocide against the Slav minority and the tumultuous events of the Second World War, culminating in 1943 with the de facto annexation of Trieste to the Third Reich, its occupation by the Yugoslav army for 40 days in 1945, and the ensuing summary execution of thousands of Italian nationals and Slovene and Croat collaborators in the foibe. In the first slide, we have seen we have see here the slide of the burning of a Slav cultural house in Trieste on the 13th of July 1920, which is very important, important historically because it signaled the rise of fascism first in Italy and also in Trieste. Slide. Uh, during <coughs> the fascism regime, Trieste was uh, uh, still part of Italy, uh, but of a special status because of its uh, autonomous heritage uh, in the past years. We see here a march in the main square of Trieste on the only visit by Mussolini in 1938 to the city. Next, please. Uh, during the German occupation in 1943-45, many people who objected to fascism and nazism were uh, in turn in this uh, buildings, which were the old rice factory, and it constituted the only extermination uh, plan in Italy, where some 5,000 people were, were burnt alive. Next, please. Uh, in 1945, for 40 days, as I said, the Yugoslav army occupied Trieste, and withdrew after 40 days 
following pressures by the Allies. Uh, Trieste was occupied one day after by the New, New Zealand Army. And many New Zealanders are still remember the 40 days that they spent in the city. Uh, <clears throat> between 1945 and 1954, Trieste was under direct rule by an Anglo-American administration, while both Italy and Yugoslavia continued to claim suzerainty over the city. Its police force and Triestini employed by the Allied administration were singled out as being pro-Italian when they were employed to quell pro-Yugoslav demonstrations. And in 1952 and 53, of being stooges of the Anglo-Americans when directed to suppress pro-Italian demonstrations. Next, please. We can see uh, part of the 1953 riots in Trieste following <coughs> some uh, declaration by the Allies who wanted to leave Trieste and to settle forever its, uh, its status of independent city. Next, please. Some of the British troops in Trieste were attacked by Italian youth and uh, who also, next, burnt uh, police vehicles during the demonstrations. The Italian governments favored the setting in Trieste of Italian refugees uh, from Yugoslavia because, understandably, they were staunchly anti-communist and were used as a bulwark against what was at the time called the threat of Slavo-communism. Italy, after the return of its administration in 1954, encouraged people to be pro-Slav or supportive of an autonomous or even independent Trieste, of having previously been employed by the Anglo-Americans or suspected of being lukewarm in their support for a Trieste Italiana to emigrate. Some 20,000 of them, representing approximately 10% of the people resident in the province of Trieste, among them, the majority of Triestini who served in the Polizia Civile did just that. Uh, next, please. We see in, uh, <coughs> a photo, an historical photo, of uh, people living in Pola in uh, 1947, following uh, the uh, Anglo-American decision to give the city to Yugoslavia and they are boarding a ship called Toscana, who uh, left Pola for uh, Venice, and the same ship, a few years later, brought Ital a Trieste migrants to Australia. Uh, next, please. Uh, we see here the people of Triestini who are working for the police force, who left Trieste and uh, came to Australia later via the United Kingdom, and in the middle of them is the former uh, governor of Trieste, Major General Winterton. Next, please. In uh, 54 and 55, the exodus of Triestini begin. We see here a group uh, living with the fire ski in July 1955. Next, please. Some Triestini thought that coming to Australia was like uh, going uh, on a tourist trip. And you can see seeing a group with a photographic camera, sunglasses, and very light bags embarking uh, the ship Toscanelli. On, on the 15th March 1954, the first ship of Trieste migrants left Trieste on board the, of the Castel Verde, which is the, on the cover of my book, bound for Australia. In the following years and months, until 1961, Several departures took place. Ships names like Toscana, Toscanelli, Castelverde, Fersi, Aurelia and others became said household names in Trieste. In order to prove the point that their living their birthplace was caused by political motivations, one of the departing ships, the Toscana, exhibited a large bunting bearing the wording, the mother is coming back, but her children are leaving. Photograph, please. We see a photo of the 1954 Toscana leaving uh, Trieste in a very rainy day. Next, please. Another photo of the Toscana on the following trip. <coughs> Next, please. 
the Aurelia, and again, yet again, loading thousands of uh, migrants. Next, please. You can see here uh, <coughs> the departure of the Fair Sea. And the next one, we see the enormous crowds uh, who were farewelling the ships as they were leaving the city every, every month. The first impression of Australia, in most cases, was negative. Accustomed to their solid brick and stone homes in Trieste, to city life, they found life in the corrugated Nissan huts of the Australian migrant hostels, in the desolation of the Australian bush, depressing. Next one. We see here one of the Nissan huts that uh, was uh, uh, welcoming the Triestini in the Greta camp near Newcastle. Yeah. This is a photo from Bonneguilla uh, in February 1955 with a group of Triestini who came here through uh, via the United Kingdom. Accommodation, as we see in the hostels, were more than primitive. This is uh, accommodation in a center in Western Australia where two Triestini were living and actually they conceived uh, the, their sons in this place. Uh, next one, please. Facilities in the camps were rather primitive. We see here the barber shop, uh, usually in, on temperature exceeding 40 degrees. Work, work also proved a confronting reality. Accustomed to the rel relatively comfortable life of police duties or office and administrative tasks, many migrants were not accustomed to heavy manual work and avoided it as soon as they could. We see here uh, some migrant working in, in the railway works in Newcastle. Another one, who is next one please, who decided to go opal and diamond prospective in South Australia and incidentally made a great uh, fortune by discovering opal and sapphire uh, mine um, places. Work in the snowy mountains river was also very hard and very taxing given the harsh climatic conditions. We see the next one uh, photograph for the huts in winter covered by snow in Cabramara in 1958. We see the next one, the accommodation of some Trieste migrants in Western Australia. Uh, we can see the stove, the chimney just outside in the, this very small accommodation huts. But uh, taking advantage of the network of friends, they flocked to Australian main, main cities, preferably Melbourne and Sydney, to look for work. Most, being single, found accommodation in boarding houses, many run by other Italians. In Sydney, they spent their spare time in bars frequented by other Triestini or in Italian clubs like the Italo Australian Club and the Apia Club. We see here a photo of 1955 of the uh, up of the the <coughs> the cafe, the bar, the bar sport, which is here at the end of uh, Leichhardt. The next one is a photo, an old photo of the Idle Australian Club in George Street, which has been demolished. It was a, a main uh, meeting point for Italian migrants since 1947. The next. In George Street, yes. The next one is the old Apia Club, also demolished uh, to give place, place to uh, marriage uh, uh, place. Uh, next one. Uh, sorry, we come to that. Some of the Triestini <coughs> realized that uh, they had a need to establish their own clubs in order to maintain their dialect, culture, and traditions. The first Triestine club, Associazione Trieste, was created in Sydney in 1961, followed by similar bodies in Melbourne, Geelong, Adelaide, Perth, and Brisbane. Most clubs were active during the 60s and 70s to decline thereafter when Italian immigration to this country, the Triestine one in particular, dwindled 
to a trickle. We see here a club. Can we go to the previous one? This is the, the building which hosted the premises of the Associazione Trieste, also in uh, Paramata Road, just uh, as you get out of Norton Street. Uh, in, next one, please. In 74, the Alabarda Sporting Club was created in, in Adelaide in, in 74. And we see here a photograph of 1989 when Trieste's bishop paid a visit to the Melbourne uh, <coughs> Alabarda San Giusto Club. Triestini also published their own newspapers and bulletins, bilingual and in dialect, to keep in touch with each other and to advertise their activities. In Sydney, the first issue of La Cittadella, playing on the name of a like sheet in Trieste, 